Hello and welcome to Fit Pros Live. You are in store for an educational and engaging session. Your instructor is live and able to answer questions that you drop in the chat. And we encourage you to respectfully interact with one another. Check your company's well-being portal for more live sessions this week. We are a community of wellness warriors. Now let's slay the day. Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Meyer Tapia and I am an educator, a wellness coach. I get to work with a lot of companies and individuals in different well-being practices and pursuits as well as run a wellness program at Stanford University. And I'm here today to host a workshop around giving, which can be a tricky topic. This can elicit a lot of guilt, a lot of shoulds, and I am offering this time for you maybe as more of a space of self-acceptance and self-understanding of who you are and what lights you up and what giving might look like for you in a way that actually felt good and sustainable. So where we are going over this hour or 45 minutes is starting with the acknowledgement of why giving can feel hard and also why it can be important and beginning with the beauty of being a selfish giver that maybe that is okay. Um, we'll dip into a bit of what we can give, being creative around what generosity means how we cultivate a, a sort of giving practice, if you will, how we strengthen that practice and ultimately how we sustain that practice. So workshops like this can often be inspiring and even illuminating, but also a total waste of time if they don't translate to actual sustainable, accessible change for where we are right now in our lives, not for the hypothetically perfect lives where we have tons of extra time and energy and motivation for generosity, but these lives, as we are living them right now, what does it look like to give and how do we actually make that happen? So if we were all here together live, I would offer this question in the chat and love to hear your responses. But since we're not live together, I'm well, maybe you are live with a facilitator um, and you can share your responses in the chat. I wish I could see them. I'm recording this for you early, but just to sit with this question of when have I given and it actually felt really good? What have I given or what's a context in which I have given that it actually felt good to give? And you may notice as you think about that, the distinction between the sort of guilt-laden, hard giving that feels super sacrificial and difficult that we can kind of narrate in our heads. And then maybe the more natural, the more instinctive, even joyful kind of giving that has maybe happened authentically along the way for you. This is when giving can be really hard. This is one of the most common ones I see. We try to give something that we actually don't have. We commit to donate money and it's not just a gentle sacrifice, but it actually hits us harder than we can really sustain. We may go into debt to give because we think that's going to make us a good person, or we may um, put ourselves in an unsustainable or uncomfortable place financially because we think we're supposed to give to X, Y, or Z cause. We give time we don't have. This might be the number one thing I see that we sign up for stuff because we think it'll make us a good person or we feel an obligation. And then we realize we don't have time to do it. So in order to follow through on that, because canceling or not following through would make us feel like an even worse person, we sacrifice our own sense of well being. We stay up way too late. We give less to the things we want to give our time and energy toward to get this other thing done. 
that we didn't really want to spend our time on or didn't have the time to spend our time on. Same thing with energy or even a skill. Like, sure, I'll bake cookies for the bake sale. I don't bake. Or I would love to babysit for you. I actually don't know how to sit with a kid. Uh, I would love to help you with your yard work. What even does that mean? So this is often what can create that tension of, oh my gosh, giving feels so hard. And I feel like such a bad person because it feels so hard. Giving can also be hard when we try to give in a way that feels really out of alignment for us to a cause that maybe we don't believe in or to an event that we're not fully behind. Giving is hard when we try to give in a way that we simply don't enjoy. Like maybe I know how to be around a kid or I know how to do yard work, but I hate it. And that's just going to build resentment around the idea of giving again in the future. And I've alluded to this one already that we think of giving as this thing that really nice people do. <laughs> and maybe we don't identify as really nice people like, oh yeah, those philanthropists, those people who seem to love everybody, they're the givers and that's just not me. So why not just give up there and not do all of the giving? Here is, well, the name of this talk that I was asked to give was the health benefits of giving. So I wanna give you that. And number one is that it feels good to give. If we are giving in alignment, something that we actually have and are able to give, and especially something we enjoy giving, but not even always. This can happen even if we're doing something that we don't really enjoy, but we believe in it and we want to give anyway. There's this boost of all these yummy chemicals in our body, serotonin, which boosts our mood. We get a dopamine hit often from giving, which is that instant pleasure boost. And oxytocin, which is often referred to as the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. This is that deep sense of social connection that is elicited when this oxytocin is released in our bodies. There was a study done at Harvard not too long ago where it was learned that people received more joy and satisfaction from giving money to other people than from spending that money on themselves, even when they predicted that they would give them more pleasure to spend the money on themselves. They gave that money often to a stranger, not even to someone they knew really needed it, just gave it away kind of blindly. And they received more pleasure than if they had spent that money on themselves. Lower blood pressure is a proven health benefit of having a regular giving practice, as well as just lower stress levels in general, because there's less cortisol being released in the bloodstream when we're in a state of generosity. There's this term health span, which means basically to live better longer. So we're not just increasing our lifespan, but we're enjoying the longer years that we're living. Um, one thing that's not on here, I would say is maybe even more of a mental health benefit than a physical health benefit is the beauty, the freedom of not being obsessed with ourselves for a minute. You'll often hear folks in AA talk about this because service is such a pillar of recovery from addiction. Whatever that addiction is, we all have at least a couple. It's whatever the substance or thing we might be addicted to may be, addiction is this kind of whirlpool of self-obsession, of our cravings, of our shame, of our desire, of our pleasure, of our shame, of our craving. And so to give to someone else momentarily gives us a break from self-obsession, which is tremendously freeing and healing. And it is the 
selfish good deed of this feels amazing to me and I need this good feeling and it's also a gift to you. So I'm going to start here with just this offering of what if we gave what we want to give, when we want to give it, and where it feels good. You know, what if we actually let this be easy and destigmatize generosity, philanthropy, giving as some inaccessible idea and said, what do I actually want to give and who do I want to give it to? What would feel good to give? When the pandemic hit a few years ago, I am a meditation teacher. That's one of the primary pieces of work that I do. And I decided to host a drop-in meditation on Zoom a few times a week. It would be free. I just would invite my family, friends, community, whoever to pop in and meditate with me for those two weeks that we were going to shelter in place. And it was because I needed that. I needed to teach it because teaching is the opportunity to say out loud everything that you need to remember. <laughs> it keeps us honest. And I also wanted to practice meditation in community. I really felt that need. So I thought, here's my selfish good deed. I need this space. So I'm going to host it and I'm going to invite anybody to come for free. Side note, it's been three and a half years. We're still going when the two week shelter in place extended and extended and extended, just forget it. Like nobody wants to stop. We've got people dropping in from all over the world. Uh, some people come a lot. Some people come once anything in between. And it's just become this sweet space to drop in and pause and breathe. And it all stemmed from my selfishness, which interesting how we think that's a bad word to be selfish, but not to be others ish. Uh, it, side note, if, you want to join that meditation, by the way, it is, um, you can get the zoom link on my website, sarahmeyertapia.com. It is still going and still free and you're always welcome to pop in. So shifting away from wanting to be the best at giving, if you're like me, there can be a tendency to anything that you do, you want to be the best at it. So what if I release that? Because how would I even decide what would make me the best, most generous and altruistic giver and just aim to be an authentic giver? Again, what feels good to me to give? And who do I want to give to? And when would it feel good to give? On a Tuesday night at 8 p.m. in some PTA meeting or on a Saturday morning, you know, that who am I and what works for me? So here's some ideas of what we can give. Notice that money is the last one on this list, maybe because it's the most obvious and commonly thought of. And also for many of us, it's the least accessible thing we can give. What about giving our presence, our full attention to somebody like our own family or a person who's been wanting to catch up over coffee or the person who's helping you check out your groceries. What if we weren't also on our phone or trying to make a list or get things done and actually gave eye contact and genuine, genuine curiosity of how they are and just spent that moment with them? If it's the two minutes that they're bagging your groceries, if it's the hour that you're having dinner together, what if we gave our full presence and attention? Imagine if someone gave that to you and you might get a sense of how meaningful that would be to receive. Similarly, time. How many of us have people in our lives or maybe we are those people in our lives who would just love to spend some time with someone they care about. And time feels like a more precious commodity than money often to think less about giving a certain amount of dollars and think about giving a certain amount of hours of human connection. A smile. How do you feel when people smile at you? A compliment, my goodness. How does it feel for someone to tell you, you look amazing, you gave an incredible presentation. You're so intelligent. I really love your perspective and insight. 
compliments, especially for people big on words of affirmation, they can last weeks, months. Giving tangible help with something that you are good at, helping somebody fix their computer, uh, helping somebody assemble Ikea furniture. Maybe you're great with pets and you take somebody's animal for a walk or you are really good with kids and you help babysit. Maybe you're great at cooking. You deliver some meals. You know, start with thinking about what am I good at and who would benefit from that because maybe they have different skills. And then yes, of course, the money, the food, the resources that others may need and we may have extra. So how do I cultivate a giving practice? What does it look like to start intentionally giving on a more regular basis? What would I love to receive? This is a window into what you might enjoy giving, right? Not necessarily what everyone would love to receive just because we would love to receive it. We have very different needs and desires. But if we just want to tap into what would I enjoy giving, it might be connected to what would feel good to me to receive. I know I am a words of affirmation person, so I would love to get some compliments. And it's therefore pretty easy for me to think in that way and kind of look around me and say, ooh, what could I say to so-and-so that would just make their day? What are you available to give? Be honest, tell yourself the truth. What kind of time do I actually have or not? What kind of money or resources do I actually have or not? I am always available to give a smile. I may or may not be able to volunteer at a school event. So telling yourself the truth about your availability is going to help build positive experiences of giving rather than experiences laden with this visceral resentment. And then you're of course not going to want to do it again. Who would you love to give to? We'll talk about other people as well, but let's just start where it's easy. I'm a big believer in starting where it's easy to build those positive experiences. What would just like make your day to, to give to somebody? If you think about a person in your life who you know it would just light them up if you showed up with a cup of coffee at their office door, start there. So I'm going to invite you, I'll pause for a moment so you can name this for yourself and maybe if you can all share in the chat where you are in this given moment, but one super micro but very tangible way you can give today before you go to sleep at night. What will you give and to whom? So that's cultivating a giving practice as in <clears throat> just starting starting where it's easy, getting the ball rolling, having some things that feel good. Now, strengthening a giving practice, building upon that initial momentum of, oh, giving can feel good and it's okay that it can feel good. It doesn't, it's not like it only counts if it's hard <laughs> or it only counts if it's painful or costs you something really uncomfortable. Giving still counts if it feels good for you too. If we want to strengthen that practice, though, a little bit and move beyond what's easy or who we would just be really happy to give to, I wonder, you know, what feels challenging yet still doable? So maybe the idea of volunteering at the raffle table at the school carnival is a stretch for an introvert like me. I know I could do it if I bring a cup of coffee and mentally prepare. <laughs> I can do it. And I know that it's a need. They, somebody's got to sign up for that. 
that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Not, you know, give the, the, the speech at the event. If that just absolutely terrifies me to my core, but what feels challenging yet doable? Here's a kind of tender yet lovely thing to think about. Would it be hard to gift? But it would ultimately feel good to gift. Who in your life, or maybe that you don't even directly know them, but a group of people, some kind of cause that it feels challenging or uncomfortable to give to. And yet, you know, in that deep down way that's beyond your personality that would actually feel really fulfilling and satisfying. If this is a person or these are a group of people who could use this support in this way. And while it's harder for me to show up to that, I know it would feel good to show up to that. I'm gonna give you some space now to see if you can name a challenging yet tangible way you can give just this week before the week is over, what kind of stretch, yet doable stretch, might you be able to do in terms of giving? I think of this as the brave space, right? So there's safe space, which is completely comfortable. And then there's wildly, dangerously out of my comfort zone. So we're talking about the brave space where I know I can, and I know this would be fulfilling. And I know this would be a stretch in terms of my energy or my time or my finances, my resources. And it is something that I can do and want to do. Name that, at least for yourself, maybe share with each other, a challenging and yet tangible way that you can give. So we've talked about beginning a practice of giving. We've talked about strengthening, building upon that practice. Sustaining might be the most important thing we talk about, right? Because getting from an idea to executing that idea, turning it into action is often the most challenging part for us. How do we sustain this? So I want to talk about a framework that um, a woman named Gretchen Rubin designed. You may have heard of Gretchen Rubin. She's written several books and podcasts and things on a lot of different topics, but one of those topics has to do with motivation. This is part of the science of behavior change, if you will, that there are different types of ways we're motivated and not everybody's motivated the same way. So she wrote a book called The Four Tendencies. You can just take the Four Tendencies quiz on her website, um, but you might not even need to take the quiz. Once you hear me describe these four types, you might identify pretty quickly with, oh yeah, that's me. So if we're trying to change any behavior, like eat differently or move differently or start journaling in the morning or stop shopping online or going grocery shopping instead of ordering food, going to bed earlier, whatever it is. There are different ways that we are motivated to put something like that into action. The most common motivational type is what Ruben terms the obliger. And this is the person who is never going to make a change unless she says it out loud, tells somebody, puts it on the calendar, and has some accountability to it. So if I'm going to start swimming three mornings a week, and I only tell myself that I'm doing that, I won't swim three mornings a week. But if I tell you I will meet you at the pool at 7 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I will be there because I've got somebody to show up for. So what does this mean in terms of giving? If this is you, that you know you will never do it unless you say it out loud to somebody else, 
if you are starting a giving practice, you know, you wrote down a tiny micro way you can give today. You wrote down a stretch, a more challenging way you can give by the end of the week. Write this on your calendar. Tell someone you are doing this, like text somebody right now. I just made a commitment that I am going to spend an extra 15 minutes talking to my kid after dinner before we clean up the dishes because I want to give them my time. Make a list of what you're going to do. Plan what you're going to do. This is the way that you're actually going to sustain your giving practice. The second type of motivation, this is where I identify, is the rebel. So the rebel is not, like the minute I hear I should do something, it is the last thing I want to do, even if it was my idea. So if I frame this as my in my head as I should really give more, I should be a more generous person, I immediately don't want to do it. I immediately like want to hoard everything and not give anything away. So it's really important for the rebel to language giving from an ownership space. Like I'm choosing to give. This is my idea, not I should give this time, energy, money, whatever. And there needs to be some fluidity and spontaneity around it, along with the structure to actually get it done. So you can see as a rebel how I framed my offering to you. Like what's one way that you can give by the end of the week? So there's still some days to choose when we feel like it. But also within this container of a week, I want to have given something. The questioner. This motivational type is really research heavy. I need to know why it matters. So where, you know, the obliger is only going to show up at the pool if I've got you to meet there. The rebel, as soon as I make a plan to meet you at the pool, I'm not going to, I'm going to cancel like the next morning or before I even go to bed, I'm going to tell you I'm not coming. <laughs> so I should never make that plan anyway. The questioner is not going to start swimming until they have researched the best flippers, the best goggles, the best swimsuit, um, looked at the health benefits of swimming, which type of swimming should I do? Should I do freestyle? Should I do the questioner will question so much that they never actually get to action. So when it comes to giving, the questioner may want to know why, you know, coming back to the health benefits of giving, the questioner may question what kind of giving should I do? What should I give? When should I give? What's the best way to give? There's all these organizations that need resources and how do I pick which one? And it is a legitimate question of like, where do I even start? This can feel overwhelming. So one of the best things a questioner can do in making that decision is boundary how long they're allowed to ask those questions. As in, I am going to let myself research and brainstorm and compare and contrast and make my pro con list until X day. And then I'm going to make the best decision with the information I have. And I'm just going to do something. I'm just going to give something. Remembering that I'm not locked into that one thing forever. That's not the only thing I can ever give. If I didn't like it, I can do a different thing next time, but I'm going to do something on X date with the information that I have. Lastly, the upholder. The upholder is motivated by their own intentions and showing up for other people. So if I'm an upholder and I say I'm going to swim Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m., I don't have to tell anybody else I'll do it because I said I would. And if the upholder is making a plan to meet you at the pool Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m., I'll do it because I told you I would. The upholder follows through on every commitment, which is a great quality and also can be a a big edge, right? A downfall if an upholder commits to too much because they will follow through on it. And if they commit to more than they can actually do, the upholder will build a lot of resentment. So giving the upholder 
leader needs to be really honest about what they're available for and think twice before committing to showing up to volunteer, to giving X, Y, or Z, because once they commit, they will do it. And if they've committed too much, they will resent giving. So think about what type you are and how you can therefore set yourself up to give successfully in a way that works for you, that actually feels good and builds a positive experience. So as you enact your giving practice, here are a few questions that bring it into the nitty gritty, that ground it in reality, moving from thought to action. What does this actually, really, in real life entail? How much time, how much energy, would I have to go grocery shopping? Would I have to order something? Do I need to set aside a certain number of hours to do this? When is that going to happen? Basically, what would have to be true for me to give this? Looking at it from all angles before you commit, what would have to be true for this to happen? And then once you decide that it is in fact something that you want to do, how am I going to remember? How am I going to make it happen? So here's the thing. What we practice grows stronger. This is such a broad statement. It's true of everything. Whatever I am good at now, I have likely practiced for a long time. I'm great at anxiety because I have practiced anxiety my whole life. I am good at criticizing myself and others because I've practiced that a lot. I might be good at a sport. I might be good at speaking a language. I might be good at technical skills that I have spent hours and years practicing. If I've never practiced something like meditation or donating time or money or giving gifts or thinking about giving people compliments, if I've never even thought that way, I'm not going to remember to ever think that way. The only way I'm going to, so here's the thing, let me back up. It's not hard to find five minutes to meditate. It's not hard to give someone a compliment. It doesn't take that much time to send someone a smile. <laughs> but what's hard is the energy required to make a different choice, to do things differently than we've always done, because we have neurons in our brains that are adapting and growing and shrinking in response to our actions. When we do certain actions a lot, that neural pathway gets really thick and strong and easy to travel. We don't even have to think about it. It's the science of habit. And then when we don't do other things, those neural pathways wither. So we currently have strong neural pathways in our brains associated with the things that we're practicing often. If we're deciding we want to establish a giving practice, and that is not currently a thick, strong, habitual neural pathway in our brain. That means we have to intentionally practice giving. It's not gonna be a habit. So we need a glaring sign in front of our face that says we're doing this differently now. So this is the not so sexy, but the really practical stuff of like the power of a sticky note, <laughs> the calendar reminder, Maybe it's a picture that you put at a place in your home where you're going to see it and be kind of like, oh yeah, we're doing this differently. That's right. Um, this is this picture of this beautiful thing that makes me feel grateful. That's my reminder that I am going to express my gratitude or a compliment to somebody that I love today. It's finding the way this is tying back into your motivational type as well. What's going to remind me that this is what I'm doing now? And connecting it to why we're doing it. So this is my last point and probably my favorite thing to talk about when I talk about doing anything new. I have taught numerous behavior change classes, um, coached a lot of people who've wanted to make changes in their lives. And there are tips and tricks and tools that work for some people and not for other people. 
But the number one difference between people who successfully do what they want to do and people who don't is actually how they talk about it. This is huge. It applies, like I said earlier, to any kind of change around how we're working, how we're living, how we're exercising, how we're eating, how we're spending money, whatever. In this case today, we're talking about giving. So statements like, I have to go volunteer. I know I need to be a more generous person. I should really give more time to my loved ones. The shoulds, the supposed tos, the have tos are victim words. They're disempowering. These words imply someone else is standing over us, telling us what to do, what not to do. And again, if you're a rebel like me, then you don't want to do it, even if it was your idea. And if you're an obliger, then you'll do the thing you should do to get your gold star. And then you might realize no one's even monitoring this. No one really cares that much. This wasn't my idea in the first place. I didn't even really want to do this. And then it doesn't last. There's very little in life we have to do. Very little. I didn't have to give this talk. I mean, I chose to because I committed to do it and I have, I value integrity. Uh, I want to get paid. I love this stuff, all kinds of reasons, but nobody made me do this. It's true for most things in our lives. And yet it's so common to be like, I got to fill the gas tank with gas. Well, no, you don't. But if you want the car to run, then you got to choose to put gas in the tank. So here we can acknowledge that we don't have to give anybody anything. It's your life. It's your choice. If you've decided that giving would be of benefit to you in some way, then own the fact that it's a choice. I'm choosing to give because I want to feel good personally, to get a break from my own self-obsession. Maybe I'm choosing to give because I really value this person or this cause and I want to give to that. There are infinite reasons. But what I love about this framework is we don't have to lie to ourselves. We don't have to convince ourselves that we love giving. We're so excited to give. We're in the mood to show up and man the raffle table at the, at the carnival. Like, no, we can even be sassy and honest and say, I don't want to do this. And I am choosing to, because I value giving, because I care about my kids' school, because I want to be the person to sign up because somebody has got to sign up, whatever. But being honest with yourself, Owning your choice and connecting that choice with why you do really want to do this, why it's important to you. And then you're so much more likely to do it. So I am going to start wrapping up here with just a warm reminder of the two things that you have written down. One to do today that's super easy. One to do by the end of the week that might be a little bit more of a stretch connecting in with what motivates you and why it's important to you to do this, knowing that you don't have to, but you can choose to. Um, on the screen, you have my info. Again, my website and business is just my name. So it's sarahmeyertapia.com. That's where you can get that Zoom link for meditations, get a whole bunch of free resources, written material, as well as info on working one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, wishing you all well. Uh, take really good care.